from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, our next guest, author Nathaniel Philbrick, is himself a history buff. And he's written numerous award-winning books about our nation's past. Many of these, including In the Heart of the Sea, Sea of Glory, and Mayflower, reflect his lifelong love of sailing and the sea. Has anybody been sailing before? His more recent books, Bunker Hill and Valiant Ambition, focus on the events and figures of the American Revolution. In fact, the American Revolution is the backdrop for Nathaniel Philbrick's first children's book, Ben's Revolution, Benjamin Russell and the Battle of Bunker Hill. School Library Journal describes it as, quote, a stirring account of the American Revolution, sure to resonate with elementary students, end quote. Nathaniel will be signing copies of his books from two to three down in the signing area. So without further ado, let's put our hands together and welcome Nathaniel Philbrick. Hello, it is great to be here in DC on this rainy day and great to have you sitting around here. And yeah, I write books about history, about things that actually happened in America's past. And Ben's Revolution is about a, a boy who was 12 years old when the revolution broke out in Boston, Massachusetts, which is actually the city where I grew up, where I was born. I was born in Boston, but I, uh, actually grew up in a place called Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. All right, some Steelers fans out there. And it was when I was in fifth grade, I read the book that would really change my life, Johnny Tremaine. Yeah, we have some Johnny Tremaine lovers out there. I mean, this was a book about a young boy who was apprenticed as a silversmith. So he was making silk beautiful silver bowls and platters and things, and he suffered a terrible accident, and so that he couldn't be a silversmith anymore. And he got caught up in the revolution and became a real important part of it. And for me, it was just amazing. History wasn't about dates and statues of old people. It was about kids just like me, who uh, ordinary kids, who got caught up in extraordinary events. And this was just, you know, like, I just couldn't believe it. So that's, back in the past, were people just like me. And then I went to high school, I had a great history teacher named Miss Wilt, who taught me about American history. We, uh, we still exchange Christmas cards uh, every year. And, and, and then, when, in 1984, when I was almost 30 years old, we moved to Boston where the revolution broke out in 1775. And by that time, I had a year and a half old daughter named Jenny, and I was at home taking care of Jenny while her mother was a lawyer uh, keeping us going. And we lived in the North End, which is the historic center of Boston. And it's just so cool. It has all these crooked streets and old houses. Some of them look like they're gonna fall down. And then, and I used to push Jenny's stroller through the crooked streets of the North End, and we'd always end up at the top of this hill called Copps Hill, where there was this really, really old burial ground where they had stones, you know, the old gravestones. And you know what? There were, it was so old that this grave, these gravestones were there when the revolution broke out way back in 1775, more than 200 years ago. And some of these gravestones had chips in them from where British soldiers who didn't like the, the politics of whoever was buried there fired on the gravestones. And that was just a, amazing to me to see a stone that had been chipped way back in 1775 during the Boston Revolution. And when you look out from Copps Hill, you look across Boston Harbor, and there, not too far away on the other side, is a place called Charlestown. And there is a monument, a great big tall monument, sort of a small version of the Washington Monument that you have here. And it's where the Battle of Bunker Hill was fought. And Jenny and I would look out at that and I began to wonder, 
what was Boston like back in the time of the revolution? And so every, we developed a routine where every Sunday, I sort of had that day off, and uh, Jenny's mom was taking care of Jenny, and I would get on what uh, is called the T in Boston. It's the subway. And I would go to the, our, the Boston Public Library, and you'd go into the stacks, and I was look, what I wanted to find out was what was Boston like back then? And I, I just learned some amazing things that Boston, the way it looks today, was nothing like Boston looked back then. Now Boston looks like a city that's all spread out, that has a bunch of neighborhoods. There's the Back Bay neighborhood, there's Beacon Hill neighborhood. But back in 1775, Boston was an island. It was a 1.1 square mile island with high hills, almost like mountains, three mountains dominating this little island. And then it had this very narrow band of land that can, it was called the Neck that connected this island to the town of Roxbury, which was on, on the mainland. And so, so that was, oh my gosh, is that the way it was? And across from the Boston Harbor was then Charlestown, which was a town on its own little island. Now, and this got me to thinking, it was for the first time back then I w wrote about sailboats. And I started to say, I want to, I'm, I'm really interested in what it was like in the past. My wife and I and Jenny and, and eventually her younger brother Ethan ended up moving to an island to Nantucket Island that's off uh, uh, the south edge of Cape Cod in Massachusetts. And this island is 30 miles out to sea. If you take a ferry that has cars on it, it takes a two and a half hours to get there. And I was just fascinated by this island. And I said, and this was the whaling capital of the world back in the 19th century. And so I started learning about Nantucket's history. And I would ultimately write my first book about history about Nantucket. But when I was researching it, I got all of that book, I got all of these stories about Boston and the Revolution bubbling up. Benjamin Franklin, have you ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah. Benjamin Franklin's mother was born on Nantucket. And Benjamin Franklin, at the time the Revolution broke out, was in England trying to stop the Revolution from happening. He was hoping that we could all, ha that England and her American colonies could figure out a way to, to avoid a war, but it didn't happen. And he became one of our foremost patriots. And have you all heard of the Boston Tea Party? The Boston Tea Party? Okay. Well, there were three ships in the Boston Tea Party that came from England with tea that the king wanted to sell to the colonists. But the colonists were angry because there was a tax that, that was going to, they were going to be charged if they bought the tea. So what did they do? They threw the tea, they took the tea off the ships and threw it into the harbor. And what did they call it? Yes, the Boston Tea Party. And, and in fact, w uh, one boy who was watching all this shouted out, and this is in my book, Boston harbor is a teapot tonight. Well, two of those ships, guess where they came from? Nantucket Island. They were whale ships that had taken whale oil to England and then on their way back put tea aboard and had brought it back to sell to Boston and then got caught up in the Boston Tea Party. So I was going, wow, I want to write about the revolution. And then, you know, Nantucket is an island right? And we know Boston was an island. And, and Boston back then had 15,000 people in it. That's a small, it's a small town. Do you know how many people live year-round in Nantucket? 15,000. And I began to realize after I lived on Nantucket for a few years, you know, if you're living in an island with 15,000 people, you get to, you may not know everyone's name, but you know them. You know what they look like, they're familiar to you. And I began to realize that the, when the revolution broke out in Boston, it was friends, neighbors, acquaintances that suddenly 
you know, they used to work together, but suddenly their differences meant that they didn't like each other necessarily. And the change that created in a community, I began to understand in a very emotional way. And then on Nantucket, we have a tradition that many New England towns still do. It's called the town meeting, where to decide very big issues of the day, everybody who is a voter on Nantucket goes in, we go to the auditor, our high school auditorium, we have a town moderator who, who runs the meeting, and we vote on issues that are very important to us. And so you hear people yell at each other, you hear people praise each other, but you know what this, this is democracy. This is democracy being enacted in a town. And that's where, how the Boston, the revolution in Boston began, was with town meetings with people in town meetings discussing the issues of the day. And, you know, those of you who have been on the internet and maybe know chat rooms, back in 18th century Boston, as the revolution was beginning to swell around, across Massachusetts, those were the chat rooms, the town meeting. And I realized I've got to write about the revolution. So I would write a book called Bunker Hill. You guys told you about the monument, it's about the battle, but it begins with the Boston Tea Party and follows as, because the British, once they heard of the Boston Tea Party, they're very angry and passed the Boston Port Act, which closed the, the city of, Bo the town of Boston as a port. It gave the people no way to make money to support themselves. And they sent a, a general, General Thomas Gage, to become their military governor and the people were not happy. And more and more soldiers came to Boston, and more and more people who considered themselves patriots left the uh, town until Boston became occupied by 9,000 British soldiers. That's a lot of British soldiers. And pe the people who stayed in Boston, many of them were not happy, and there would be fights in the streets and a lot of tension until finally, on April 19th, 1775, when Thomas Gage sent some soldiers to the town of Concord to, to get the cannons and guns and ammunition that the Patriots had collected there, he sent several hundred soldiers out and on their way to Concord, they had to go through the town of Lexington. And on the green in Lexington, there were a whole line of militiamen stood in their way. And guess what happened? The first shot of the revolution was fired. When we don't know if it was a militiaman or a British soldier, but it started. And then the British then went and several militiamen were killed. They then go to Concord and then they have a big fight at the Old North Bridge where more people are killed. And then the soldiers have to fight their way house by house back to Boston. And they get back to Boston the British close Boston to the, anybody who's not par on their side. All of those militiamen who were um, from every town crowd into nearby towns of Cambridge and Roxbury, and suddenly Boston is a British-occupied city under siege. At one point, the British think about trying to punch out and attack the Americans, but to stop them, the Americans decide to build a fort on Bunker Hill. They would get the wrong hill. They'd actually do it on Breed's Hill, so it's a little confusing. But it was by when the British woke up on a June morning and saw this, this, this fort, they decided they were going to attack them. And so they sent over 2,000 British soldiers in boats across the, Brit across the harbor they rode them across, they offloaded onto Charlestown, the peninsula, and they marched up the hill towards this fort, which was full of Patriot soldiers. They thought they would be able to take them very easily. They were under General Howe, who was leading them. They went up once, and the Patriots stood their ground and forced the soldiers back. They went up twice. Again, the Patriots held their ground and forced the British back. And a third time, they went up and the Americans, the militiamen ran out of ammunition 
They had to. They could only fight the British soldiers with their musket, the butts of their muskets, hitting them over the head, and they had to retreat. And the British won the battle, but they had lost so many soldiers. Almost half their soldiers had been either killed or wounded. That it was a British victory, but a moral victory for the Americans. And now everyone in Boston, many of whom had watched the battle on the roofs of their houses, this just happened a half mile across the harbor. It was like, you know, we watch, sometimes watch things on TV. They were watching it from the roofs of their houses, and they were, knew that the history of the country and the world would, could change with this battle. And they realized this was no longer a rebellion. This was now a war. A few weeks later, George Washington, you guys ever hear of him? Yes. George Washington arrives and takes charge of the army. And he will, it will become the Continental Army. He conducts a siege for nine months trying to get the British out. A bookseller who becomes the artillery head of artillery for the American army, Henry Knox, brings cannons more than hundreds of miles down from Lake Champlain to the north. Those go on the high ground uh, overlooking, overlooking Boston, and the British realize they have to leave. And in March 1775, the British leave, and Washington has knocked the British out. The war would go on for many more years, but this was the beginning. And it, while I was researching Bunker Hill, I discovered that there was a 12-year-old boy named Benjamin Russell, who, uh, when the re who, who was good friends with the newspaper man, Isaiah Thomas. And when the, on the day that the, the revolution broke out, on April 19, he was in school. They uh, hear of the revolution, they follow the British soldiers who are sent out as reinforcements off the island of Boston, down the neck to Roxbury, follow the soldiers across the Charles River to Cambridge. They play in Cambridge, having a great time, and then they start hearing firing. They hear the British soldiers coming back from Lexington and Concord, fighting their way back to Boston. They go, oh my gosh, we better get home to our parents in Boston. But when they turn to go back to Boston, the British soldiers say, stop. You cannot go back to Boston. The war has begun. And so, Benjamin Russell and his friends are trapped outside Boston during the siege of Boston. Benjamin Russell becomes employed by the American army. A Connecticut general, Israel Putnam, becomes his boss. And he supply, helps supply food to the soldiers who are digging earthen forts around Cambridge. And then, on the day of Bunker Hill, he hears firing in Charlestown. Israel Putnam rides like crazy over there, and the Battle of Bunker Hill unfolds. Ben and his buddies go up to Prospect Hill, a high hill that overlooks Bunker Hill and Boston and watches the battle. It's an amazing scene. And this actually happened. And then his father eventually escapes from Boston, finds Benjamin, and apprentices, he becomes an apprentice to Isaiah Thomas, the newspaper man who is now in Worcester, Massachusetts, publishing The Massachusetts Spy, Benjamin Russell will one day become one of the foremost newspaper men in New England. But it all began in the American Revolution. I realized I have to do a book about this. So I decided to go with Ben's Revolution. It tells his story. And it was a wonderful, writing this book was so much fun. Trying to tell it to young people and working with the incredible artist Wendell Miner. And I want to, I'm going to end by reading a passage from Bunker Hill. Okay, uh, from, excuse me, Ben's Revolution. Okay, it's the winter of 1775. The British soldiers have arrived in Boston. There's tensions with the Boston citizens. There's fighting in the streets. The boys are not happy that there are British soldiers. They, they go to the Boston Common, which is still there if you go to Boston, where the British soldiers are, are practicing their maneuvers. And they say, go home, you redcoats, go home. Well, that winter, a, a storm comes, and Ben and his boys go sledding. 
and this is what happens. This chapter is called Boys' Rights. That January, a storm blew in from the north and blanketed Boston in snow. When classes were over, the Queen Street Writing at the Queen, Queen, Re, Queen Street Writing School, where Ben was a student, he and his friends got their wooden sleds to go coasting down the icy streets of Beacon Hill. They started near the mansion owned by the merchant and patriot leader John Hancock, pushing their sleds across the rutted snow and ice until they seemed to be flying down the hill. Ben was leading the pack as they rushed down School Street when suddenly his sled slowed down. Ben was outraged to discover that ashes had been spread across the snow and ice to make the street less slippery by the British officer who had moved into a nearby house. With several friends at his side, Ben marched up the steps of the British officer's house and rapped on the door. The officer was soon at the doorway. Ben explained that for years, this was the boy's favorite coasting place, and now it was ruined. To Ben's surprise, the officer ordered his servant to pour water over the ashes. Soon the water had frozen to ice, and they were coasting once again. Ben had been taught to believe that the soldiers were in Boston to take away his liberties. But this officer had proven to be an understanding man. Later that night, the British officer told General Gage about his encounter with Ben and his friends. The general gave a weary sigh. No wonder we are having so much trouble with these Bostonians, he said. Even the children insist on their rights. And it actually happened. You literally cannot make this stuff up. And so I realized I just had to tell Ben's story. And, and so Ben would be involved with this sledding incident. And I'm going to end by reading when he learns of the first shots of the revolution. On the morning of April 19th, 1775, Ben walked to the Queen Street Writing School, just as he did every day. He and his friends were sitting at their desks when they heard the sound of a fife and drum on the street outside the school. Master James Carter sent a boy to find out what was happening. He came back with amazing news. The previous night, General Gage had sent 500 British soldiers on a secret mission to seize the cannons that the Patriots had hidden in Concord, about 20 miles away. But the mission had not remained a secret for long. By midnight, Patriot riders like Paul Revere, ever hear of him, and William Dawes were headed out of Boston to alert the countryside that the British soldiers were coming. Each town in Massachusetts had its own militia made up of patriots who were willing to fight for their families, farms, and freedom. When the alarm was spread, thousands of them said goodbye to their wives and children, took up their muskets and powder horns, and headed to Concord. But would the militiamen have the courage to stand up to the British soldiers? At daybreak on the town green in Lexington, the patriots showed they had courage. When the British soldiers charged toward them, the militiamen held their ground. The British fired their muskets, and eight militiamen were killed. When Ben and his schoolmates heard this, they were stunned. After more than a year of mounting tension, people, ordinary people, just like them, had been shot dead by British soldiers. It now seemed as if all hopes of settling matters peacefully with the British were gone. Master Carter looked at them with a solemn yet excited expression on his face. Boys, he said, and this is true, he said this. Boys, the war's begun and you may run. And thus begins the adventure of Benjamin Russell and the Battle of Bunker Hill. Thank you very much. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.